Principal Product Manager here at Operative. Um, we are starting our webinar about closing your, biz, your billing cycle as fast as possible. Um, on the phone we have Nicole Cooklin and Mike Scherdeman from cars.com. Um, and we hope that you find this uh, webinar uh, interesting and useful. Um, so why are we here? Um, the problem that we're trying to tackle today is that it takes too long to build clients. For, for many of our customers across the uh, operative uh, user base, uh, we see that, that uh, clients are taking up to seven or more days to actually complete their, their end of billing cycle reconciliation and invoicing process. And we believe we have identified a couple of reasons why that happens. Uh, some of the reasons include uh, manual billing reconciliation, so basically the, the lack of uh, systems or processes to do this. Um, delivery discrepancies are also a big component of this, as well as uh, communication across different departments to clarify information that may appear on sales orders, um, information that is crucial to billing that does not appear on the sales orders or the, the metadata associated with those sales orders um, and doesn't get communicated to uh, the appropriate finance staff who then have to act on it. So the, the reason to attend this webinar is to learn some best practices specifically around billing digital advertising campaigns. Uh, we won't be focusing on any other type of media today. Um, and at the end of this, we hope to show you um, some best practices that you can incorporate in your own organization to shorten the billing cycle. Um, Cars.com has developed what we feel is a best-in-breed system for making sure that their billing goes out on time. And we hope to extend some of those practices and make them more generic so that um, people who uh, adopt these things can actually find them useful for their own organizations as well. A couple of notes about the logistics of this, uh, of this presentation. Um, all attendees are obviously in listen-only mode if any of you have been trying to talk to us. Uh, we can't hear you. So if you do have questions, and we hope that you do, we've allotted a Q&A period at the end of the session. And there is a way for you to type in your questions into the GoToMeeting window. Um, and I will be reviewing those questions and uh, pulling a, a handful of them out for Nicole and Mike to tackle as well. And if, for those of you who have attendees uh, in your organizations who are not able to be here, the session is being recorded and will be made available within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. So before we get started, um, just a little bit about Operative uh, as a company. Um, we are an 11-year-old company who have uh, been in the digital area for about 11 years now. We have two main components to our company, one that provides uh, SaaS software for uh, digital uh, companies, or digital uh, publishers to run their business, as well as a managed services component um, that does uh, ad trafficking on behalf of the, those same digital publishers in some cases. Uh, we have about 250 employees worldwide in offices in New York, Sao Paulo, London, Melbourne, and Bangalore. And uh, we count among our customers approximately 200, over 200 media industry leaders um, who are pushing uh, roughly 100,000 placements through us in terms of trafficking and approximately $6 billion of global ad revenue run through either our managed services or software solutions. So we, needless to say, we've had a lot of experience uh, dealing with customers in this space. We feel like we have a fair amount of understanding about the pain points. Um, and uh, specifically, my area of expertise is in the finance uh, functionality in our marquee platform, Operative One. Um, I'm the, the product manager for that area, so I do a lot of the design and requirements work for that piece of the software. So I, I get to talk to a lot of clients as well about their pain points. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Nicole and Mike, and they can introduce themselves and get us started. Good morning. This is Mike Shurtevon. I'm the Senior Finance Manager at Cars.com. I've been here for about four years um, and six years overall in the company. And I'm Nicole Cooklin, and I have been at Cars.com for just under 10 years, and I manage our sales operations team. Right. 
So just a short introduction of who Cars.com is. Cars.com was founded in 1997 and is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. We have about 1,000 employees um, there's throughout the United States. About half of them are here in Chicago. Um, we have about 10 million car shoppers visit Cars.com a month for research, new and used vehicle search, side-by-side -side comparison, expert reviews, consumer reviews. videos and other necessary information to help make them a competent buying decision. And so for the purposes of our discussion today, we're in advertising and the sales team that sells our national ad. For example, the Buick ad is shown here on our homepage. This sales team sells national advertising primarily to automotive manufacturers and non-automotive specific advertisers like insurance or financing companies. The national sales team is comprised of 24 sales executives, six account managers, reporting analysts, and management. The account managers at Cars.com are a key reason we can close our billing quickly. These members of our team own a campaign from start to finish once the contract is in-house, and they should know every minute detail of the contract that they're managing. As a team, we work closely with our product and advertising solutions teams, with ad operations, and with finance. Just a brief background on the finance structure at Cars.com. Um, each company is slightly different depending on how you guys are set up. But overall, the Cars Finance team is responsible for all the budgeting, forecasting, all the revenue and expense related items to Cars.com, as well as the financial statement. And they are actually embedded in the different departments. And I support the national sales team and are responsible for the accuracy of the revenue each month. We also have a corporate finance team that contains our account payable, account receivable, payroll, and billing teams. Um, as far as systems, we use PeopleSoft as our financial and billing systems, Operative One for our national sales team, and we use accrual accounting. We record revenue expenses in the month the revenue and expenses happen. The financial analyst that helps support the national team completes the billing, any of the insertion order approvals, billing terms, and adjustments. So why close billing in days and not use estimates with accrual and accounting purposes? It is a great question. It really made me stop to think. We have been doing this since I've been here. So I actually didn't actually um, come up with any rational reasons on doing it. The first easy answer is cash flow. The quicker an invoice is received by the customer, the quicker the payment, which is always dependent on the contract payment terms. This is a great process for startups or smaller companies with cash flow needs or even struggling companies. Another reason is revenue recognition. The revenue is recorded when the invoices are posted within PeopleSoft. Of course, there's always exceptions. About 98% of the revenue is recorded via the billing process. I will discuss later in the presentation some of the exception reasons. Having the system calculate all the billing logic and complete the posting, it removes and removes the manual calculations and any estimating at the end of the month. What I feel is the biggest reason we close billing within days, it helps with discrepancies. With that said, you might be asking yourself, if we close billing within days, wouldn't that increase the discrepancies? Yes, more than likely it would. But we have built multiple audits and checkpoints in place throughout the month to help ensure accuracy and reduce discrepancies. Also, having the invoices mailed to the customers within the first five days gives us more time spent resolving discrepancies with the customers and less time researching what we should bill. Lastly, by having the billing finalized and mailed, managers, finance, and all other departments can focus on the, um, as I was stating, I was saying how the invoices are mailed to the customers within the first five days gives us more time spent resolving discrepancies with the customers and less time researching what we should be billing. Lastly, by having the billing finalized and mailed, account managers, finance, and other departments can focus on the future months, and we can also use the revenue reports with the actual to help forecast the future months and base trending on actual revenue instead of the estimates. So overall, it frees up everybody's time.
So now we're going to walk through the life cycle of an order at cars.com. From when an RFP arrives to when an invoice is sent, we have a lot of steps throughout the process that help us close our billing quickly. We'll then review and highlight what we consider to be a couple of our best practices. So after an RFP is received or sales determines that we have inventory that we would like to offer a client, they determine exactly what advertising solutions they'd like to offer. They then request the available inventory, eventually entering the proposed order and the inventory in both operative and, if necessary, the client system such as Mediavisor. When an order is entered on our end, the salesperson determines the likelihood that the order is going to close. By entering the proposal on our end, we can then run regular pipeline reports for sales management. These reports break down potential revenue by the percent likelihood to close, and these percentages can then be updated by sales throughout their sales process with their clients. And if you should look at these numbers, just note that they don't actually all add up. The terms and conditions are then negotiated by sales, and the details of the contract are nailed down. Once the contract is received by a salesperson, the details of the order and the T's and C's are reviewed for accuracy and then immediately handed over to the account manager that works on that campaign. He or she will then ensure that the contract is signed internally and by the agency. And then the account manager works closely with the sales team to ensure that any order details or nuances with the contract are clear. The billing terms are key component to this discussion because it's not always crystal clear how a client needs to be billed by simply looking at the contract. We may be billing on actual delivery up to a monthly cap, straight contracted amounts each month, or a number of other scenarios. I think we probably generally have five standard billing scenarios that our clients use. The account manager will then translate the client's contract into our internal order. This may be done by editing and updating the proposal that was previously entered, or in some cases, the account manager may enter a contract from scratch. At this point, all of the order details must be checked and rechecked. Custom fields must be filled out, and billing terms and details must be selected. All of these seemingly small details lead towards a seamless end of the month and good reporting throughout the life of the campaign. If required fields aren't entered, the contract is automatically rejected, and it can't be pushed through to add ops to go live. <clears throat> so moving into custom fields, custom fields are, is our key to our speed in closing the billing within three days. Um, it also is very helpful with reporting and variance analysis. When we converted to Operative One, the account managers and the finance team spent a lot of time creating custom fields, really understanding where the information would reside why we're entering it, and how the information would be used. Making sure that we're all under the same understanding helps out with the process of why we need to enter it. On the screen, you see two fields. One's called product description, and one is product ID. These two are examples of ways that we use the custom fields to improve the billing process time. We take the data and export the fields out of operative. And these fields are very necessary to load the data back into PeopleSoft, which we use for our billing. Without having these fields in operative, we would need to manually add the information or look up the information in a different manner. All companies have different billing or financial systems that may need specific fields, and by using these custom fields, it's a great place to add the information that is needed. Not on the screen, we also assign each customer within operative a PeopleSoft ID, so that it could be matched into the financial and invoicing systems. And this helps have one record throughout all the different systems that we can track a customer. Another field on the screen we have is make. Make is not used for billing. This is actually used for reporting. It helps us pull consolidated reports on a make level, and it also helps us with some variance analysis throughout the month. So this is just an example how we kind of use the custom field just for reporting needs. The last custom field on the screen is our billing profile. And this is kind of one of my favorite because it helps me a lot. Um, it is, the field is used for the, with the finance manager and allows myself to pull reports and analyze our contract billing. And by contract billing, 
it's invoicing the customer on the value of the contract and not the actual delivery. I use the report to create journal entries and kind of calculate our deferred revenue. For revenue purposes, we are not as concerned with how much was invoiced, but how much revenue was actually delivered. So by having this field within operative, it helps you provide what should be recognized throughout the month for certain campaigns. To note, the account managers also review the recognized revenue columns within the export file to ensure that they're accurate. We do have some other general custom fields that we use for customers, such as purchase order, agency insertion order, and any other specific requests for the agencies. So once a contract is set, the account manager will then push it through for final approval. Both sales management and finance must approve every contract. This step also will trigger notifications to sales management and anyone in product or solutions that may be affected by a particular product that was sold on this contract. Once it's approved, the order is then pushed through to ad operations to be trafficked. The ads are then trafficked and they go live on cars.com. The account managers should then be QAing their ads to ensure that everything is live and tracking in both our internal ad server as well as the client's ad server. We have an internal tool that we use to match up primary ad delivery to third-party ad delivery, and that helps us with this reconciliation. The account managers are regularly pulling reports from operative to review this data to ensure that we're delivering to contract and that there are no discrepancies or trafficking concerns. If any issues arise, the account managers will then typically work pretty closely with ad operations and the particular trafficker or solutions to resolve these problems. Also during the month, the financial analyst pulls weekly reporting. Currently we are pulling a month-end export file from Operative, the same one we use for billing. We're able to use this export file because the billable record is created as soon as the order is active. Reviewing the data throughout the month is key to having correct fields and billing information. Even though they're checking it during the approval stage, this is a secondary check to make sure all the fields are accurately filled out. One of the keys is the revenue is not within the weekly report. We pull that information from a different pipeline, which I'll get to in a second. We, all, we used to only run the export at the end of the month and try to keep billing sped, sped up, but we kept finding that there's small data issues and fields missing, and by having it pulled weekly, we fix those issues before we even start the process to help run close even more efficient. As far as revenue projections, the finance manager pulls weekly revenue projections, usually for the current month and the next month. Sometimes we'll even look out for the rest of the years by using a sales pipeline report that's built within operative. We take all the projections for all the active orders, and then we currently manually review orders that are in the sales proposal state not active orders yet, to determine if we should include them in the forecast. This is one of the areas we, we can improve in the future and maybe automate the calculations. During this whole weekly revenue forecast, we're working very closely with sales for any items that might be missing from the system. For example, we're currently looking at the April revenue forecast and working with the sales team to understand if there's any missing orders for any of our fiscal year-end clients, their year-end on 331, and if the new orders are in the system yet or not. After the weekly sales pipeline report is created and the revenue is analyzed, we spend a lot of time looking at the weekly variances to determine what new sales came in, what changes might have been made to specific orders or any other issues coming from the reports. As far as change orders, as many of you on the call, we receive a lot of change orders for active orders throughout the year. Any changes to the I.O. will go through the normal I.O. approval process with approving from account management to the financial analyst. If any of the changes are related to past billing amounts, the finance manager will need to review and approve the change. Even though it's not ideal practice of changing past invoices, there are cases when it is necessary. The financial manager needs to review the total, to make sure the total billing has not changed, request any new invoice or credit to be issued and determines any impacts to the deferred revenue. So then at the end of the month, 
things are wrapped up. And the first day and a half of the month is the busiest time for an account manager at cars.com. In most cases, we bill off third-party data. So the account managers immediately pull all delivery for the prior month and then import that data into Operative One. If we're billing off of our own DSP data, that delivery data is automatically pulled into Operative. Since the billing logic has already been defined for each contract, the account managers should then just need to review each contract to ensure that we're invoicing the correct amount and that we're recognized and deferred revenue amounts are accurate. We have operative set up to ensure that we can't bill over the line item amount, which is another operational efficiency, and ensures that we never overbill our clients. Once each campaign has been reviewed and edited as necessary, it's marked as pending final review, and the account manager will then do this until all of the campaigns that he or she manages are ready to be exported for finance. There are a couple of cases where we rely on our clients to give us data to complete this process. If for some reason the client cannot give us data by noon on day two, we will go ahead with the billing process for all other IOs, and we don't let these couple of campaigns hold us up. Moving into the true invoicing aspect, the financial analyst from corporate finance exports all the billing information around noon on day two. We immediately lock all the invoices within operative, so there cannot be any changes made to these invoices. We will hold up the export if there are any known material issues. Any customer data, as Nicole was just stating, not available at the time of the lockdown is, is entered into operative at zero dollars, so we're not billing on any estimates. The financial analyst reviews the custom field that we were discussing earlier. They also are making sure the overall billing total is within the reasonable range of our weekly forecast. Audit all new insertion orders that came in during the month and confirm with the account managers any items that were zero within the export to make sure they shouldn't be billed except for any of the exceptions that we were discussing earlier. If the insertion order was a zero dollar because of missing information, the finance manager needs to be aware so they can accrue the revenue. After the initial spot checks, the financial analyst will randomly select random orders to ensure proper billing amounts have been calculated and research insert orders billed in prior months but no longer are being invoiced. The financial analyst will import the final billing file into PeopleSoft to start the invoicing process. Please note, Operative does not create invoices. We use PeopleSoft for our billing and financial system. As soon as we have a true file going into PeopleSoft, the finance manager will use the export file to calculate any deferred revenues, accrue for any missing insertion orders, accrue for material variances found during the billing process. That these processes can also fall into day four. Day four I call, for myself, accounting day. The finance manager reconciles the recognized revenue from the PeopleSoft general ledger to the billing file. We also spend the day reconciling the general ledger to weekly forecast and to the budget and forecast figures. By the end of the day, we close the month within PeopleSoft and all financials are final. On day five, we start the invoice creation and we invoice the customers by insertion order and do not include the line item details. The invoices are sent via email or regular mail depending on the customer's preference. We do throughout the month, we do receive disputes or discrepancies that are received from our accounts payable team. For any discrepancies, the account payable team will reach out to the account managers to determine if the issues are correct or if there's some other issues. We could possibly work with the salesperson if there were some changes that we weren't notified for. After the items are researched, we, an email is sent back to the accounts payable team confirming or denying the request for the credits. At that time, the finance manager must approve any rebuilds credits because of the revenue impacts, commission impacts, and impacts to deferred revenue. Nicole and I will also work closely on any of these issues to determine if it's a one-time problem or if there's, we need to put a new process or fix an issue going on within the system. So there are a few things that we consider best practices and that help us wrap up our billing relatively quickly and painlessly. 
We have multiple checkpoints throughout the life of a contract, starting at the proposal stage all the way through to when an invoice is sent to the client. Between sales, account managers, finance, and the rules that we have built into operatives, no problematic order should ever get very far in our process. Secondly, the account manager owns the campaign from start to end. He or she should know every single detail that has to do with the given order. If the wrong ad tags ran per day, if we have monthly billing caps at the line item level or at the order level. Two, if a client requires screenshots with their invoice. One person is responsible and owns all of these details. We also have all of our third party delivery associated to the appropriate line items and operatives right away when an ad goes live. We don't wait until the end of the month to make these associations or pull and review our third party delivery. So there should never be a surprise or question regarding delivery. Also, create custom fields that are beneficial to your company. If it's a need for reporting, if it's a need for billing, if it's a need for any other type of variance analysis, work with other team members to understand why they might need a custom field and how you're going to use it. The data points save a lot of time during processing time or even researching time. Setting up billing logic and profiles is also very necessary. It allows the system to calculate and perform the calculations for you, and it reduces time and errors throughout the process. And one of the biggest key is communication. Working with every team that's impacted and understanding why they need the information, and having people ask the proper question when orders don't look correct or if something is missing helps at the very end of the month end. If you could do 99% of the questioning before you even start processing billing, it speeds up on reduces the time that is necessary. So at this point, we're going to transition back to Jerry so he can moderate the Q&A. Jerry? Thank you. Uh, that was very that was an excellent presentation, Nicole and Mike. Um, and we do have a couple of, of uh, questions uh, that have been posted to our chat room. So I'm just going to go through and select a few at random. Uh, well, not totally random, but uh, some of the more interesting ones. So the first question is, um, how does the number of active campaigns affect your five-day schedule from start to finish? Um, and then there was a sub-question that said, what is the average number of campaigns uh, that you guys run through your system and, and that you uh, use to adhere to this, this five-day schedule? Sure. So I would say on average right now, we have about 300 to 500 active orders a month. And if that grows significantly and throughout the last, you know, we've probably done this process for the last five years anyway, but really since I've been here, so nearly 10 years to a certain degree, we just will eventually add new account managers because we need the bodies to, you know, do basically everything from start to finish. So if our orders increase a ton, we'll just add new people and new heads to the account management team. We've also added the corporate finance person that Mike spoke to in the past year or two years, and that has helped us significantly mm -hmm. also. Okay, great. Um, we also have another question about how you define your organization in terms of uh, users who play a sales role versus users who play an account manager role. So what differentiates someone in sales versus account management? The account managers do report into sales. They're considered client services folks, um, and they basically handle everything post-sale. So. Our sales executives and our planners basically do everything pre-sale, and once the contract comes in and they have reviewed it with the account manager, then the account manager handles everything post-sale. So we basically draw a line in the sand and say, salespeople pre-sale, account managers post-sale, and obviously we communicate with them regularly and we have to pull them in if there's a change order, if there are questions to the campaign. But that's basically how we define the difference between the two. Great, thank you. Um, so we had another question about talking about uh, what the percentages 
between uh, orders that, that basically bill using primary delivery versus the number of orders or percentage uh, probably uh, per month that use third-party delivery? Wow. Um, I'm estimating here that probably 95% of our campaigns bill off of the third-party delivery, so off of our agency delivery. So that's a key thing for us throughout the month is to be tracking that third-party delivery regularly and ensuring that we're tracking properly and that we have everything buttoned up with the agency ad server because if that isn't tracking correctly, then we won't be able to bill for anything that doesn't track. But yeah, we probably okay. only have 5% of the campaign filling off our primary numbers. Okay. Um, we've also had a number of questions about what tools are available to associate third-party data right away. Um, I know that, that it, maybe you want to talk for a minute or two about the, the, the tool that CARS uses, and then I can talk about the capabilities that Operate One um, offers in terms of third-party uh, delivery association. Sure. So I know there are external tools available um, for this process. But we built a tool in-house probably six years ago, I'm guessing. And it basically takes an export from Operative, in our case. And we were using Operative's dashboard in the past and their old QMS system even prior to that. And we would export all of our line items from the system. And then we would match those line items up to our third-party ad delivery. So we would get an export from DFA or from Atlas, whoever it may be, and we can match multiple lines to a given line within operative if necessary, or it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Our tool will then save that relationship. So when we import the data the next day or the next week, that relationship is always built and always there, so we don't have to continue rematching this data. We then will export an Excel file from that tool and we can import that into Operative. And we can then pull reports that show both our primary ad server delivery, which is DFP's delivery, as well as all of the third-party delivery. Great. Jerry, do you want so, to talk about um, the Operative system? Sure, yeah. So Operative does have a built-in solution for doing this type of reconciliation automatically. We have a module within our platform called Campaign360 which has integrations with several major uh, third-party delivery providers, uh, such as DSA. Um, the list includes uh, Point Roll as well, um, but that was also mentioned. Um, and that delivery reconciliation actually happens on an automated basis um, every night. We actually reach into the third-party systems um, and actually pull reports and, and use other types of integrations to pull that third-party data into operative um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, as a corollary to that, that data is immediately available uh, on invoices and is basically tallied up and displayed in context on an invoice and an invoice line basis. So the delivery is attributed to days that fall within a billing period um, that happen to fall also fall within the line item date range for that, for that line item and are displayed um, in context. And if the uh, invoice was set up to do so, it will also automatically use that delivery to calculate data, uh, to calculate an invoice amount. So uh, to the greatest extent possible, one of the best practices overall is to use automation to the greatest extent that you can. Um, Operative One offers some native capabilities. Um, CARS has obviously gone the route of, of using an internal tool to do the same type of activity. Uh, but we definitely encourage everyone to not rely on manual reports, not to rely on, on people actually doing VLOOKUPs to match uh, you know, primary delivery to third-party delivery because it can get very hairy and it's uh, extremely error-prone. And it is one of the keys to uh, the successful shortening of the billing cycle. It's the ability to have that data always be present and not to wait um, until the end of the billing cycle to worry about having delivery in the system. All right, um, there are some other questions about um, the number of discrepancies that you guys happen to see 
uh, on average and during a given month. So um, there, there, uh, and then along with that, um, there was a question that asked, how many uh, line items uh, are, you, are you invoicing? So it, it, to be fair, you guys are invoicing at the line item level, correct? Yes, we are invoicing at the line item level. And as okay, for the and number of those, the number of, of the, the, I mean, I'm sure there's probably tens of thousands of line items in any given billing period. Of those, how many of them actually display discrepant data that needs to be resolved by finance? By, usually, if there's discrepant data, we've resolved it earlier in the month. So it usually doesn't get to finance if there's discrepant data. When we're looking at our primary delivery and comparing it to third-party delivery throughout the month, that's when we may find a discrepancy and work with ad operations to figure out what that problem is. You know, it doesn't happen regularly, but when something does come up, we'll work with them. It's a small percentage of our line items where that happens. We may have implemented an ad tag wrong, or maybe the client's ad tag just simply isn't working, or oftentimes if it's a point roll or a rich media ad tag, we may have to work with point roll or that rich media provider on that problem. But as far as discrepant numbers, I mean, it's here and there, it's hit or miss. There's yeah, as far as like after we invoice, I mean, we get... I would just, on average, three to five maybe a month. I mean, there's not a lot. And a lot of it is just we didn't update something or a contract wasn't signed, so it didn't go through the system for the invoice. So we actually had to fix it. And we're, we're, it was a known error, but we still had to go back and fix it. So basically the, the takeaway message here is that, is that you are proactively monitoring the incoming delivery that comes into our system and you are identifying discrepancies and cases and places where data may be missing because a third-party billable ad server has not been specified or because that data hasn't been imported into the system, you are not waiting until the end of the month in order to identify those cases. You're, you're basically sweeping at least once a week uh, and, and your campaign managers and account managers are responsible for that task. So by the time the, uh, the billing cycle actually closes and you are ready to, to invoice, you have already resolved those discrepancies. Exactly. Okay. So we had a couple of other questions here. How many people does cars.com have in that account manager role versus the finance manager role? So what is the, the relative distribution between people who are account managers versus um, versus uh, finance people. So currently we have six account managers for the national sales team and we just have one corporate finance analyst and one cars finance manager and that seems to do the trick currently. I'm sure that you know in the next months and years to come we'll be adding to both of those roles. Mm -hmm. And. Um, on a, on a more finance-related note, how does cars.com handle adjustments to prior billing periods? And, and, and where do you guys track that, those types of changes? So to prior period adjustments, we do a credit rebuild process within the PeopleSoft. So we kind of credit out the old invoice and rebuild the new invoices with the new um, changes. The key is to work with the account management team and at that time, we will unlock certain invoices to make sure they accurately represent what we were invoiced. But only I have access to uh, unlock invoices and work with account management to make sure it's fixed. So is it fair to say that you're also truing up the accounts in your, in, or is it truing up the actual contracts to reflect those types of adjustments? Correct. Okay. So at no point... Is there a situation where a downstream activity like a credit or adjustment is done in PeopleSoft without somebody actually going back into Operative and making that same adjustment there? Because otherwise your, your revenue pipeline reporting would be probably completely off. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, and we have some uh, questions about like the scale of ad products that you guys are offering. So. Uh, in terms of your product taxonomy, um, how many different types of ads or how many ad products do you guys have? 
oh my word, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we you can probably we have a just lot. The thing a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, when we do have a lot, and there's a lot of overlap, to be honest. So we basically break up our site a few different ways. So we have the buy channel of our site and the research channel of our site, and then within buy, we have new cars and used cars. And automotive manufacturers tend to want either new car inventory or used car inventory. And so we'll break all of that up by make, model, and then if folks don't buy it by make, model, you can buy by category of a car. So you could buy a luxury car, sports car, convertible, or you could then purchase um, a number of different ways. So our taxonomy is pretty deep. And there is a lot of overlap, so it can be rather confusing. And then we also have our general sponsorship. So in this screenshot, you see Buick owned the home page when I took the screenshot. And there are other sponsorships, obviously, throughout the site. If we went into crossovers, somebody would own that crossover package. And the same goes for any of these different major pages throughout the site. Got it. Um, and, and transitioning over to how you guys, how does the decision get made uh, as to which billing terms to use? Uh, someone asked, do you guys have specific billing terms per client? Um, alternatively, um, you might have specific billing terms per product. We, ha we have both. So we do have certain products that can only be sold a certain way. So maybe a flat fee for only certain products or certain products may only be sold CPM. Otherwise, we basically let our agencies dictate the billing terms to us. We sign their contracts, and they are the ones that make those rules up. So we have a few preset billing terms within Operative. We bill on actual delivery, and there are a number of clients that do that. So we bill on actual delivery up to the contracted amount. We may bill on the contract straight line. So if it's a $12 million contract, we would bill a million dollars every month. Um, there are some clients that may bill straight line based on the number of days in the month. So we would bill more in January than in February because there are more days in January. And we have other people that have specific capping rules. So we may bill on actuals up to a particular monthly cap for the contract, for line items, you name it. We try to work with the clients on what they need. and will give them usually what they needed. Got it. Uh, we had a couple of, of uh, questions about uh, revenue recognition. So how, do, how is it exactly that the CARS recognize revenue and, and how does Operative help them with those calculations? Yeah, so we recognize revenue when the invoice is posted. <clears throat> um, for most of our clients, we bill off of actuals, but for the few or the ones that are billed on contract or this billing schedule, we do take reports from the export, and we do have um, calculations based on actual delivery. So we kind of look at how much should have been recognized versus how much we actually invoiced. So right there should be your discrepancies between the two. If it's under, I have to defer the revenue until later times when we actually either um, deliver in full or do a make good, or in other cases, we do credit the customer back the money that is owed to them. Got it. But we also had a couple of questions that actually I'm going to take a shot at answering about what activities happen in what systems. So you guys use PeopleSoft to actually generate the invoices themselves and then email or actually probably in some, in some cases probably uh, uh, physically mail invoices to your to your customers. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, the idea here is that Operative is providing uh, the information used to um, to invoice off of. So the invoicing data is generated by Operative One. We do have the capability of generating finance exports at will at any point during the the, the contract life cycle after it's become an active order. That's an important point to me. Uh, the types of checks that uh, Nicole and Mike were talking about earlier in terms of running exports and doing variance analysis and tracking delivery, all of that is facilitated by the notion that 
the billable records for any given active order are all generated and operative at once. So if you have a multi-month campaign, um, once that becomes an active order or a contract in our system, uh, the invoicing data gets generated all at once, um, and delivery starts accumulating against those invoice line items and gets, starts getting attributed as soon as it comes in. Um, and this is what allows cars to run these types of exports on a regular basis, perform uh, you know, any kind of, of maintenance or, or analysis that needs to happen, uh, because that export is always available um, in the system. Um, so just to recap, Operative One serves as the repository for the contract information. It serves as the repository to a, a great extent uh, on the trafficking information that gets pushed to the ad server. And it also serves as the delivery and invoicing data repository and generation tool. But the actual physical invoices themselves wind up getting generated outside of Operative and get wound up getting this, you know, dispersed or disseminated uh, from, from within the context of PeopleSoft. All right, so I'm just going to take one or two more questions here. Um, there was an earlier question about packaging. So to what extent do those cars leverage the packaging capabilities in Operative One? And I, I'm going to tack on my own follow-up question, and, and how does that impact what gets invoiced versus what doesn't get invoiced? No, that's a great question, and that's one of the things that we loved about Operative One when we switched from Dashboard is that we can package line items and bill that way. So we may sell a package of, let's say, a 728 by 90, a 160 by 600, and a 300 by 250 that all targets SUVs. And we may have an overall impression goal of a million impressions. And we can set up operative to bill off of that million impressions no matter where the ad's delivered between those three ad sizes. So it may be that the impressions are split evenly between the ad sizes, or it may be that the 728 gets half and the other two sizes divvy up the rest of the impressions. But you can bill that way, and we do bill that way for many of our products, which is a great feature. Did I miss part of the question? No, I, I think you handled okay. it. So uh, okay. just to tack on a little bit, there are different types of packages that Operative One offers uh, natively within the sales module. There are packages that take the children line item and roll them up into um, a top level item, and those are called our bottom up packages. There are other types of packages that function in a top down way, where you can, uh, which basically work in reverse. Um, so there's a lot of packaging options available in Operative One, and depending on the type of package that you choose to sell, there are invoicing implications usually associated with it, but the idea is that Operative always allows you to choose at which level you're going to invoice, whether you're going to display the child line items where the ad actually served to the client, or whether or not you choose to abstract that information and simply invoice at the, at the group line item level. So that's a, something that we we do offer uh, natively. Um, so there is a couple of questions, or there is one question here that says, how many billing terms are set up in operative for cars? Um, so billing terms in our, in our parlance, uh, there are only a handful of real, of, of true billing terms that, 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 that can be used. So there are contract-based billing terms, such as uh, contract straight line and contract prorated. Um, and there are billing terms that say um, that you can that you're going to bill off of delivery, which is the primary case in, in cars in, in the car situation where they 95 percent of their campaigns are, are billed off of third party delivery. Um, there is also the ability in operative to set up custom invoice schedules as well, and cars actually does make use of this uh, quite a bit, um, where you can actually take all of the invoiceable line items and manually disperse or manually allot uh, invoiced revenue and invoiced units into specific billing periods on a custom basis. Um, so there's, there's some utilities to do that within the, in the, within the UI as well as using an Excel import. Um, and there's also other types of, of invoice terms that are a little bit more complicated where you can set up thresholds between two simple types of billing terms. So for example, there are ways 
you can set up a custom billing term to choose to bill off of primary delivery until you've reached the contract straight line amount, at which point the system will then cap the invoice amount so that it never exceeds what the straight line ought to have been. So there's ways in which the system can be configured and should be configured to make billing as automated as possible. And that is another key takeaway from our best practices, is to understand the capabilities of the system that you're using, whether you're using Operative One or any other type of system, and leverage them to, to the greatest extent possible to try and automate the calculations. It should not be anyone's job at the end of the month to sit there and try to collate delivery with line items and actually run manual calculations to figure out what the billable amount should be. Um, to the greatest extent possible, understand what your options are and leverage them as, as greatly as you can. All right, I am perusing the questions list one more time to see if there's any major themes that we've missed, but I think we've covered most of them here. Uh, well, there was one other question about handling uh, changes to proposals as they come through the system. Um, is it a challenge to have account managers enter line item level data for proposals that have not closed yet, but could change multiple times before it closes in order to try and get an accurate revenue forecast? So this is a, this is like a change management question. So how does how does CARS deal with the the notion that proposals are constantly being negotiated and renegotiated, and to what extent are they using uh, operative to track those changes? Sure. So it's actually our sales people that are making those changes because that's all pre-sale, not the account managers. And to the best of their ability, they will make updates, especially if they're large updates. If it goes from, you know, a $2 million contract to a $1 million contract, they should be making those changes to their proposal. If something changes drastically like that and is really going to affect a pipeline report, if it may be that they're just going to buy a few hundred thousand less impressions or 10,000 less impressions, then usually they don't bother making those adjustments to a proposal and those adjustments will be made once the contract actually comes in. I mean, we really only use the pipeline report for giving us an idea of what the pipeline looks like. It doesn't need to be 100% accurate, so we don't make our sales team constantly update proposals, especially if they're only at 20%, 40% likelihood to close. If they're getting closer to 100% likelihood to close, then it's more likely that they're going in there and making those changes. Right, but you don't wait until the contract is final to enter in proposals because then your revenue forecasting would be completely off. Correct. Okay. Uh, there was a, a repeat question uh, about uh, forecasting. So the, the screenshot um, said um, that, I mean, they mentioned that your pipeline looked like Excel and then it, the follow-up question was, do you take straight line delivery or do you take into account what is already delivered when, when generating uh, future forecasts? Well, that was just a pipeline report. So that report is actually not showing any active contracts. That's just showing proposed contracts. So it should okay. only show the proposed delivery for what we have out there to clients. But any active order would not show up in that. It would be a separate report that we would pull. Okay, so, so how do you generate um, revenue forecasts against those actives? That we do have a separate report. Um, we didn't show a screenshot of it, but that's something that Mike and the finance folks pull regularly. So it is okay. pulled out of operative. It is the uh, estimated delivered revenue. Um, it mm -hmm. doesn't have any of the third-party figures in there. So at that point, I'm looking at trending, and we have our um, the true up of the campaigns that we're doing each week. I work with the account management team if there's any material under delivery or any other issues on any of the campaigns that I need to factor into the forecast. Got it. Okay, and we had a question about the complexity of, of your third-party delivery and in terms of uh, differentiating between creative uh, where the, the creative was rich media and its point role 
uh, versus the ad, the ad agency server is DFA. Do you consider the point roll data uh, and bill off of that, or do you consider the DFA data and base, and base it off of that? So it's a question of, of complexity here. It depends on the agency's ask, but typically we'll bill off of the DFA data. If something comes up where we're having maybe an issue with the rich media provider, then we may alter those rules, but generally we try to stick with the agency's ad server data. Okay. All right. I think that covers us in terms of uh, in terms of questions. So I wanted to thank everyone who posed the question um, uh, for participating. This is a, a very helpful exercise uh, for me to get a sense of where where people's uh, uh, pain is and in terms of, of where the, the complexity lies. Um, and I definitely would like to thank uh, Nicole and Mike for volunteering their time and, and sharing with us um, their best practices uh, and, and, and basically setting the bar uh, for, uh, for their fellow publishers in terms of making sure that they're following best practices in order to get their, their um, billing out on time and as quickly as possible. It, it can be done. Um, we hope that you leverage Operative to do to help you do that. Um, but even if you're not, there are concepts and there are um, guidelines that are generic that can apply to anyone uh, to make this happen. Um, and we will also be publishing some of those guidelines um, on, up on our website along with this presentation. Um, and just as a reminder, for those of you who were having problems hearing or would like to uh, see this presentation and hear this presentation again, we will be posting it uh, within 24 hours up on our website. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, uh, Nicole and Mike.